Show of hands, all those people who managed to get through high school without having to take physics. <laughs> Sorry, you're getting the physics. <laughs> all right, let's start out with. Uh, go ahead and hit the slide. Remember this? We're going to talk about three items on here tonight. We're going to talk about uranium right there, 92 protons and a whole lot of neutrons. It decays to form radium which is over here, remember this side of the table is more reactive and that side's less. So there's the radium. And when it decays, it goes to radon over here in the last column. And you notice what is, else is in that column. Helium, ne neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. All of which are noble gases. Remember the, the electric lights, the, the fluorescent lights out there? Those are all the noble gases in here, and radon is one of the heaviest ones. Next slide. So, radioactive decay. Spontaneous, happens with uh, an alarming certainty, un total unpredictability. Each of these radioactive elements has a half-life, and it will decay to half of its original level within that half-life period. Uranium, one of the most widely distributed and uh, ubiquitous minerals in, in around the world. It's, it's all kinds of formations. It has a very, very long half-life. It also has an atomic structure. I love these little cartoons. It's so easy to think of those electrons when you back it. Um, but you can see there are two electrons in the outer shell, which means it's fairly reactive forms an oxide very easily. Now we can go to the next one. This is what uranium ore looks like, but you hardly ever see it in this crystallized form. That's pitch blend. Usually it's in sedimentary or limestone rock and just generally distributed throughout the rock. Next one. When uranium decays by an alpha particle emission, which is a helium nucleus, so the number goes down by four, you go from uranium-238, actually there are two steps involved, you'll see that later, uh, to radium-226. Radium is a very reactive substance, very easily reacted with all different kinds of things. Um, so it has a half-life uh, of 1,600 years. Uranium had a half-life of some astronomical number I can't remember, which is why it's just sort of present forever. And it's actually older than than the Earth, probably. The next slide is radon. We go from ra radium-226 to radon-222, and here's where the rest of the evening is gonna be spent on this little guy. Look at that outer shell. You see these around here? There are eight, of, eight electrons in that outer shell. It's a complete shell. That's why it's non-reactive. Okay, in order to have a rea chemical reaction, you need to have one or two of these missing or something else to bind up to it. Next slide. Here is the radioactive decay series. This is what we're, this is our cancer down in this area right here. You start with your AM238. Every time you see a down arrow, that's an alpha particle emission. Every time you see an angled arrow, that's a beta particle. So you go from uranium 238 down to thorium and up through the proctinium up to another uranium and then you start coming down. Here's where it gets interesting. Here's the radium 226, alpha emission to 222. And then these guys down here are what are known as radon daughters. When I started in this industry in the mining business, they used to say, well now you're gonna get your chance to expose yourself to radon daughters. Lucky you. <laughs> so you go through polonium and actinium but the, the important ones are bismuth, lead, bismuth, and polonium. And actually, that's the 214 range. Here's the 210 range. The two, each of these has a half-life. Some of these half-lives are a few seconds. Many of, some of them are a matter of years. The two important ones are lead 210, 
which has a fairly long half-life, 20-some years, and polonium-210, which has a 138-day half-life, I believe. And these two elements, the rest of these have much shorter half-lives until you get here, which is lead-206, which is a stable isotope that doesn't decay. These two elements, if they're in your lungs, are in your lungs in the form of solid particles. They are not a gas. So unlike when the radon decays through this chain, some of these things are solids. And these, when they stay in your lungs, are what uh, Sheila is going to talk to us about causing the cancer. Next slide. Here's our shale gas. The, we're over here with the Marsalis shale gas, the very large formation. There are actually three layers here. There's the Devonian shale, the Mars which goes down into Kentucky, the Marsalis shale, which starts around here and goes up into New York, and the Utica shale, which is a similar footprint to the Marsalis, just a little bit bigger, these pinker areas. We also have several fields elsewhere in the country that are major producers. The Barnett shale in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the Bakken shale, which actually is more of an oil producer than a gas producer, and then the Western Slope, Peons Basin of Colorado are all major fields. The Hainsworth field and the Fayetteville field are also fairly important uh, fields. But Eagle Ford is interesting because, and that's one of the things you'll learn here, there are two different kinds of gas, so to speak. One is dry gas, which means there are not very many heavier hydrocarbons other than the methane. And then there's what's called wet gas, which not only contains the methane, but ethane, propane, butane, etc. as you get heavier and heavier. And those chemicals, those other hydrocarbons, are very important uh, from a standpoint of industrial use. Ethane is the major building block, so to speak, of almost all petrochemical reactions. That's why Shell Oil Company at the moment is, has an application in to build an ethane liquefaction plant in Beaver County, Pennsylvania, northwest of Pittsburgh. Next slide. Okay. There is really very, very little information on radon in natural gas. There's not a lot of data points, and that's one of the major contentions that we have is that this needs to, we need to get a lot more information about what radon levels we're dealing with. Some of the limited published reports are from EPA back in 1973 by Johnson. He found a, a range, he looked at a lot of different basins, data from other people. He found a range from 0.2 to 400, 1,450 picocuries per liter with an average nationwide of 37 picocuries. And his study also confirms that the Gulf Coast gas from Texas and Louisiana offshore is at five picocuries per liter. That's the predominant source of almost all the gas in New York City today and has been for years. <laughs> the reason that we have such little radon in our gas at the moment is that we start with a very low number to begin with and then that decays further. The next researcher here is a gentleman named Gogolak with the Department of Energy. He looked at some of the Devonian dark shale in northeastern Pennsylvania and found some uranium levels. This is an interesting level. The, the, as the uranium level goes, so also will go the radon level. In other words, high rate, rate uranium levels are going to produce higher radon levels. 40.9 is a very high number, and that's because it's a dark shale. And the, the radi uranium tends to be accumulated with the darker shales. He also did, has some radon levels. He tested eight Devonian shale wells in Ohio, northeastern Ohio, and northeastern Kentucky, which are part of the, that Marsalis blob on the map. Uh, and he found a range from 26 to 249 picocuries, an average of 151. This is the figure that you'll hear quoted often, and that's, that's where it comes from. He also looked at distribution lines, and you'll see here, uh, I just put a few of them up here, there was a longer table, 14 picocuries in Chicago, eight picocuries in Houston, and New York, 1.5 in our distribution lines. That's going from the five picocuries here 
decaying over the six days that it takes to get here from the Gulf Coast, down to one and a half picocuries or less. Recently, the USGS, a group of researchers, has tested a few Marsalis whales that were uh, selected for them by the industry, and they've come up with a range from one to 79 picocuries with an average of 36, but they only did 10 tests on three wells. Not a very significant uh, cohort, so to speak. Next. Pipelines, here's the, how, how does this stuff get to us? Well, here's the Gulf Coast area, and this line going up this way is the old Columbia pipeline, now owned by Transco, that comes to New York. That's the pipeline that carries most of our gas today. Notice also another cluster from this area, it's called Henry's Hub, up through Kentucky and into West Virginia and into Western Pennsylvania, and then coming east as far as um, middle of New Jersey, basically, but not into New York City. That, that pipeline was providing gas mostly for the refinery industry here in the New York area. Next slide. Now the Spectre pipeline that many of you have heard about and paid attention to, part of the Spectre pipeline is to collect, to, to bring Marcellus gas to New York City. And the way, the interesting way that that's going to happen is in this little area here, part of the project, the part we hear so much about is the 21 mile line from Linden, New Jersey into Manhattan. This is a very important part of the whole project. This is the Algonquin pipeline, this green pipeline. What they are adding with this project is they're making it bi-directional. Instead of all the gas flowing to New England, now they will be able to take gas from the hub in Ramapo, New York, down to Hanover, join the Linden, join the uh, Texas Eastern Line going to Linden, and then come into Manhattan. And this is where we're going to get a lot of our Marsalis shale gas. Next slide. Okay, what happens to radon and travel times? Remember, it has a half-life of just under four days. So if, if the, well, as soon as it leaves the wellhead, it is now a gas and trained with the natural gas. The radium and the uranium and the thorium are wastewaters, and they, they stay with the wastewater side of the equation pretty much. So you get this partition at the wellhead between the wastewaters with the radium, etc., and the gas, the product gas with the radon. The longer that takes to get to you, the more decay it will take, the more decay will occur. Unfortunately, what happens is now instead of the five to six or seven days it takes to get from the Gulf Coast to here, it's going to take a matter of hours to get from western Pennsylvania, I used Morgantown as an example, or from Hancock, New York, that's my eastern example, and you can see that the decline from the maximum levels that USGS found is not that terribly significant. Next slide. Three concepts I want to leave you with. T-norm. The important thing here is that this is radioactive material that's naturally occurring, but that has been concentrated or made available from human activity. Next slide. There's also something called the Alara principle, as low as reasonably achievable. You add together the Alara principle, which basically says there is no such thing as a safe level for exposure to ionizing radiation. So one, one exposure can potentially cause cancer for you. When you add that to the, the mix, you add the Alara principle to the T-norm principle, and next slide, you come up with two, two points important. One, the one I was just mentioning, there's no such thing as a safe level of exposure. The EPA's four picocuries is a recommendation for one to start active mitigation, but they don't tell you that you're safe at three or two or one. And the last principle is that, go ahead, you were fine, that EPA considers the output from natural gas wells and oil wells to be T-norm material rather than norm material, which means we can do something about it and we must do something about getting rid of it and getting it out of our gas system. So you've all passed high school physics now, congratulations.
Actually, I encourage you to get emotional. I think mm -hmm. the prospect of right on with your coffee is one I can certainly get very emotional about. <laughs>